Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Welcome to Insights and Sound, live from Synthplex 2022. My guest is composer Glenn Jordan. Glenn, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, not quite sure how to start this off with you because I've known you for so long that I don't want to leave anything out <laughs> that would be just shorthand. So let's start off with just a little bit of your main credits. I know you, you go back to actually having been in the band Sha Na Na. I do. And you've also done a bunch of uh, a bunch of work for Sherry Lewis, and as well yeah. as a bunch of movies, soundtracks, yeah. TV, yeah. etc. I, I recently got a uh, thing from ASCAP saying that I have had my music in over two thousand episodes of. That's that's just as a composer. That's not the session stuff. You slacker. Guitarist. Yeah, mm. I know. I've been laying around. Well, so let's start out with a little bit of background. Okay. Um, you are much more coming from the musician side than a lot of people who come from the, the trained, classically trained composer side and all that. Yeah. Give me a little bit of your musical background. Well, I came from one of the musical high spots in the country, the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the freeway to the music business right there. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire and just got blown away by the music in the 60s. I mean, the Beatles, the Stones, all of them, especially the Beatles, of course. Um, but I just suddenly knew that's what I wanted to do. And so I went to one year at the University of Chattanooga um, as a composition major. And the head, the, the, the head of the composition department told me that all music after Bach was bullshit. Sounds like my old music teacher in high school. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was an art major. <laughs> and so, yeah, exactly. I get that. Um, so I'm sitting in my hotel room trying to take off Eric Clapton guitar solos and, and figuring out the chord changes of the latest Who record. And at the end of the second semester, I went home to New Hampshire for the summer, and a friend of mine said, Hey, do you want to come play for this band called The Spectres, who is one of the top bands in New England and I said yeah and we played in Hampton Beach Casino which dated back to the 20s all the big bands played there and so on and so forth and two nights a week we would play with another local band we would headline two nights and the other two nights of the week we would open for a name band like Vanilla Fudge, The Rascals, The Beach Boys, uh, any number of people, uh, Led Zeppelin uh, mm. Janis Joplin, mm -hmm. um, and I was 18 at the time, 19. Impressionable. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and, but I was having the time of my life, and, and the gig went through Labor Day, and my mother, I was talking to my mother on the phone, and she said, you're not going back to school, are you? And I said, <laughs> no, I don't think so. And so I stayed with that band for a couple of years, um, and as I developed as a musician, I was the guy who would want to sit there and, and take the three little guitar parts and, and wind those together as opposed to the Joey Perry kind of, you know, how loud can I get this Marshall? Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew that the Boston area was not going to be for me. I bumped into an old friend of mine. He said, I've got a gig in Reno if you come out. You know, we can play there for six months as a trio. And I said, sure. So I flew out to Reno and he met me at the airport. And he said, uh, the reason I got that gig is because I was dating the entertainment director. Uh oh. And we broke up. So, so I. Here you are in Reno. Here I am in Reno with, you know, it's uh, a suitcase full of clothes, an amp, and a guitar. And. Um, Sounds like a country song. Yeah, really. <laughs> it was a country song. And um, so I moved to San Francisco, and I, there was an agent up there, who shall remain nameless, who, um, 
who had these bands that were playing all these things. And, and I went to him and said, yeah, I want a gig. And he said, well, I can put you with one of these bands playing clubs. I said, I just drove, I just flew 3,000 miles and moved across the country not to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, do you need any arranging done? And he said, you know, I've got these bands that are headliners at these clubs and the bands that come in after them don't have the same repertoire. If you can teach them how to do their version of the same kind of songs they were doing before, you can work for me. And so I went to work as a, an arranger and what would happen is a couple nights a week, three nights a week, the bands would finish at two in the morning. I would go out and we'd rehearse for two hours till four or 4.30. Mm -hmm. And um, then I would go home and go to bed and, and I, I can vividly remember that at 4.30 in the morning, the traffic in, from San Jose to San Francisco or up through Oakland was more, there was more traffic there than there was in New Hampshire at sure. rush hour. Sure. You know, and it was uh, it was an interesting thing. But I realized that that in San Francisco, unless you happen to catch on with a band like the Doobie Brothers or yeah. uh, Journey or somebody like that, there was there was no. It was difference. an insular scene. Yeah. I, I lived there for in the late seventies, early eighties, and yeah, yeah, I know. And yeah. it, it, but it, I mean, it's a great scene. It, it, or, or it was a great yeah, scene, but yeah. uh, definitely tough to get into. It was, and a friend of <coughs> and I just decided it was time to move to L.A. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, uh, I, I should I, I knew the guys from Shawnee from way back at Hampton Beach Casino. Mm -hmm. So I, I bumped into them a couple times in San Francisco, and they said, "Well, you know." let us know if you move anywhere, and I moved to L.A., and they came into town right after that. And uh, El at the, that point, Elliot Randall had, I'd met Elliot through them, because he played with them when Vinny died, their, Vinny Taylor, their guitar player, OD'd. Mm -hmm. And Elliot took his place, and um, so I got to know Elliot. So I called Elliot and I said, I'm moving to L.A., what should I do, who should I contact? He said. Anybody you've ever heard of? And I said, you mean anybody I've ever met? He said, oh no, anybody you've ever heard of. So I'd call people like Larry Carlton out of the clear blue. Um, the three guys that were the most instrumental were Lee Rittenauer. Lee was just gracious as he could be. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I'd call him up and say, geez, Lee, I don't know, I've been here for a while, I'm not going so great. He says, don't worry about it, keep plugging. Clarence McDonald, who's a piano player at a lot of Motown stuff and mm -hmm. a lot of James Taylor stuff, Clarence would take my phone call. He'd be out on the road someplace with James, and he'd take my phone call and talk to me for an hour on the phone. Wow. You know? uh -huh. and, and the one who had the biggest impact was Jimmy Haskell. Jimmy, at that point, was one of the top arrangers in L.A., mm -hmm. hit record after hit record. He did all the stuff on the Steely Dan record, uh, my old school, night by night, that stuff. That was yes. Jimmy. Yeah. Um, and I said, I want to figure out where I am in the music business, and you know, can I talk to you? He said, Yeah, come on up to the house. Now, Jimmy was the busiest arranger I've ever met in my life. You know, he had movies of the week going on and like six record dates coming up, and so on and so forth. And he invited me to the house. And we just sat there and talked, and I played him some records that I really loved, that I really wanted to know how to create that sound. And Jimmy said to me, there's only one person in town who can teach you to write in this many styles, and it's Spud Murphy. Now, Spud was born in 1908 in Berlin, came across with his mother, they moved to Provo, Utah. Just, you know, he's got one of those, uh, Joseph Campbell kind of upbringings. You know, his stepfather and he didn't get along. He uh, ran away from home at 13 and, mm -hmm. and just disappeared. And, but he was also a musical genius. He had absolute pitch and he had a photographic memory. So he came up with this whole system called the Equal Interval System, uh, which I studied and graduated. It was a 1,200 page course, took you about the fastest guy to ever get through it was three and a half years. It took me about five and a half. Wow. And I kind of looked at it as there was my college education that I missed out on by being on the road. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I started doing arrangements and, and things around town. And then one of my friends in Shanana developed a problem um, with pharmaceutical products. And in the music industry? Yeah, in oh. the music industry. Wow. And the year before his problem got real bad, he used to call me. It would be a Sunday night. They always did their pre-records for the TV show on Monday. And at that point, I was working around town a lot as a studio musician, you know, and, and still playing some clubs and doing that stuff, but starting to reach the point where guys were calling me. And uh, my friend called me up and said, uh, yeah, I'm not feeling real good. Can you come in and do the session? And I knew that was one of two things. He'd either found way too much cocaine for his good over the weekend, or they had a complex chart that he needed to read. Uh -huh. You know, the fastest way to get a guitar player to turn down is put a chart in front right. of him, you right. know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I did the end of the season, and the production people were all very happy with my work. So he got into a, a fight with the guys in the band the next year as the TV show started. So I wound up doing that whole series of, on, what was it, 26 episodes or whatever. More than that, I think. Um, anyway, I did that whole series, and but the band was like, okay, you're going to do the sessions, but you, you know, this, you're not in the band. You're not in the band. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's fine, that's fine. I'm a professional guitarist, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had done eight weeks in their winter tour. They got two weeks off. They did whatever, three months, four months of the TV show, and they had three weeks off, and then they were going on tour. And somewhere near the end, the manager came in and said, uh, okay, show of hands, um, who wants to hang around for the next two weeks and audition guitar players? And they kind of looked at each other and they said, okay, how many want to hire Glenn? And all the hands went up and that was it, I was in the band. And um, it was a good timing thing because two things happened. We had a big music strike in 19, that was 1980 in Hollywood, and, and so there wasn't a lot of work. <clears throat> and so I was out on tour with him, so that was great. Um, and the other, um, the other thing that happened was the CS80 jumped mm. on board. And uh -huh. when I, one of the things I did a lot in the late 70s was I'd be the fourth guitar player on like disco tracks. So guys would be going walk it, walk it, and another guy would have a chorus pedal, and somebody else would have a flange or something, and I'd be the guy that's going one, two, four, one, two, uh -huh. you know, and yeah. I would, I loved it. I got paid as much as the guys with the wah wah pedals, sure. you know, and um, but when the CS80 came along, that totally changed, you know. It was like you used to go to those things where there'd be one, maybe two keyboard players, but that would be either a B3 or a clavinet and right. a piano. and a piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they, I started going to sessions or, or seeing sessions where it would be a piano player and an organ player and two CS80 guys. Wow. Uh -huh. You know, nice. and especially the TV, the TV shows. They were like, they would have four. I used to go to Knight Rider all the time when Don Peak was doing it. Uh, just to hang out, not to, you know, and there would be four uh, CS80s. Two guys would be playing on whatever they were recording, and the other two would be programming sequencers. Needless to say, we know what your next purchase was. Not quite yet, but when I got when when I got near the end of the Sean and Ah thing. Mm -hmm. But now I, I want to back you up a minute yeah, here sure. because you jumped to, you know. I got to LA, I'm talking to all these people who are yeah. sort of mentoring me, and now you're suddenly a session musician. That doesn't happen overnight either. Somebody told me, actually I think it was Larry Carlton said, well, if you're a good guitar player, and I assume you are, it'll take you about two years to get your feet under you. And, and that's, you know, you can fast forward through that in, his, in historical terms, but in reality, that two years was knocking on a lot of doors, wasn't it? Knocking on a lot of doors, playing a lot of clubs, uh, looking, doing a lot of demos, okay? Mm -hmm. That, you know, scale in those days was, I, I don't even remember what scale was, but you get paid a third of scale to mm -hmm. go in. And uh, I remember one time I showed up 
for a session to do, uh, they weren't happy with the guitar player on this album, and the producer called me and said, I need you to fix two, two songs. So I went in at like six o'clock at night, and um, at that point I'd redone every album, uh, every guitar track on the album, and um, done a bunch of backgrounds with the, the girl singer, mm -hmm. and got out of there at like seven in the morning or something, you know. Uh, you'd get stuff like that once in a while, because it's, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I did, uh, I did uh, Bobby Vinton Sings the World's 100 Greatest Love Songs, where we went through every double and triple scale drummer in town because they would only do one session with Bobby. Yes, I, I have heard. I have heard stories. Yeah. He's quite legendary. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, so you know, those things were there. I, I, you know, you basically seized on opportunities. And and, and one, one thing that I, I think, the sense that I get here is you also didn't say no. Yeah, you can't afford to say no. Exactly. Um, Though, bring that up when we're talking about my film career. And I, the, <laughs> there's a couple of times I, I, I had to say no, just ethically and morally. I couldn't, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I couldn't do, I couldn't be on that film. Okay. You know. So, at this point you're doing sessions, you're gigging with Sean and Ah. Yeah, yeah. Where did, it sounds like you still didn't quite know what you wanted to be when you grew up. No, I absolutely knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, and that was a film composer. So or let's put that composer. bug in your ear. Yeah, yeah. let's let's. Yeah. What I how how did you even identify that as a thing? Because in L.A., it is a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's 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 very much less so in New York. Um, yes. Nashville almost non-existent. But that's what lived in L.A. And at that time, this was the land of Jerry Goldsmith and, of course, John Williams and, and uh, Jamie Horner and, and uh, Basil Paladoris and, and people like that who were just doing these things. And so try, doing the same thing I did as a guitar player, trying to create opportunities, mm -hmm. take advantage of whatever popped up, but at the same time trying to create things, I started doing a bunch of um, student films yep. at Northridge and USC and, yep. and uh, you know, and... Um, Just anything to get, get credits. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also took a film class uh, with Don Ray, and, and I did a few sessions with that, but that was a who's who of who has been film composers for, mm -hmm. from that period until, the, you know, 2010 or so. Uh-huh. And um, so anyway, just once again, you're just looking for those opportunities. And um, in the la Bowser left Shanana in January of 84, mm -hmm. okay? And we did a tour. We did the next year where we, the price started to decrease. Okay, so we, we added more dates, and, and uh, in the meantime, my wife and I had our first child. And then when we went into 1985, the band was up to, instead of doing the usual 15, tour, uh, 15 weeks a year mm -hmm. of touring, they were up to 26. It's half a year. Yeah, it's half a year. Mm -hmm. And my wife was saying things like, I really feel like a single mom. You know, mm, yeah. and, and left her at home, and she was working a full-time job as well, and uh, we had a, a, a day care person who came over, but still, it was really hard on her. And, sure. and I said, well, if I'm going to make this move, I need to make the move now, and I saw an ad that Saban Productions was looking for a composer, so I went and I did a, a demo thing for them, and they were very happy with it. And um, so I, I said, well, I, I'm committed up till the 1st of January, and then I can start after that. And they said, sure. And, and uh, remember way back at the beginning of this interview from Concord, New Hampshire, 
the first day I worked for them was when the Challenger exploded with uh, Ow. with the uh, Krista McAuliffe, who was from Concord, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So it was like, wow, uh, I don't even want to get into the symbolism and, of all this, but I worked for Saban, and it was really good for me because I was coming in and working eight or ten hours every night to get these cues done for these TV shows. Um, halfway through that process, Steve Binder brought, a, put a show together called Zoobly Zoo. And he kids brought a kid's show, animated mm -hmm. show. Um, people dressed up in fox and wolf costumes and stuff like this. And Ben Vereen was in it. He was the, one of the stars. And Steve Binder was the guy who did the Elvis comeback special. Uh -huh. Okay, and Steve had been multi awards. And he had brought in a songwriter by the name of Norman Martin. And Norman had had stuff down on Broadway, lots of novelty material, and so on and so forth. And Norman couldn't work fast enough. So they said, We need to find more songs. And I said, Well, I'll do it. And Long story short, everybody was thrilled. I was so I was writing songs, also doing the other stuff I did. I was, you know, and um, by the end of that process, um, everybody in the TV show was Zoobly Zoo was thrilled. Um, said, "Oh, we'll call you for more work," and so on and so forth. The next gig I got out of them was a production assistant who was working on a documentary, and he called me out of the clear blue and said, would you do music on this? And I said, yeah, of course. And Again. Again. Don't you know, say no. Yeah. Don't say mm -hmm. no. And um, <clears throat> so Saban laid me off in February of the next year. And um, so suddenly I was out of the clear blue. I was hustling for more work. And I saw that Steve Binder was doing Pee Wee's Playhouse. Mm. And I called him up and said, hey, boy, Steve, I'd love to do an episode of that. And he said, well, Paul's philosophy is he wants, he's going to do 10 shows. He wants a separate composer on each show. Bingo. Here was the bingo. The first thing I heard popping out of my mouth is, well, what you need is a music supervisor musical director and he said geez you're right I said that's the only way you're going to have any continuity in any of this music how we right. present it right like one of the rules and if you're ever watching Pee Wee's Playhouse every time Pee Wee's walking in the playhouse there's music playing mm -hmm. um, you know every time he's the, the flower you know it, it's just it's it was a style and and I would so I would get together with people and we were using Danny Elfman and I, Mark Mothersbaugh became a friend and and um, so I did four of the five seasons of Pee Wee I was the music supervisor uh -huh. they wouldn't they wouldn't let me say musical director because suddenly that in, that it, because of union things that sure, would pop up yeah. you all, know it's all in the title but yes you yeah. were you were doing the job yeah clearly uh -huh. and so i got seven emmy nominations from that show and i won one i mean the music in that show was tremendously overlooked yes i think at how good it was yeah it's it's people who were very aware of it but i don't think they quite knew what to make of it uh -huh. and um say that about the entire show yeah yeah um and so anyway, it's, it's, I did Pee Wee, and as a result of that, I picked up a bunch of other shows uh, on the television with George McGrath. George was one of the writers of Pee Wee's. Um, and then I, I was one of the first guys to jump on board sequencing and, and the digital performer thing, or, except it wasn't digital performer, it was just performer. Just performer the, yeah. yeah. And so I was doing that. And I took a gig sequencing stuff for a producer who had a, an R&B duo that had just signed to Prince's record label, okay? And I did all the, 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 the sequence for him and got everything and we put it on tape and I was done with the project. And about three days after the project ended, he called me and he said, Glenn, would you be interested in doing a network television show? 
And I said, yeah, of course. Heck yeah. <laughs> and uh, his brother and his brother's partner and uh, Cy Rosen, who was the head writer and the creator of the show, had this show called Roomies. And it was Burt Young and Corey Hyam. And they just weren't communicating what they needed musically to the other composers. They'd already been, they'd had four episodes on the air. They'd been through three composers at that mm. point, I think. And so I went in and I sat down and I talked to them. And, and it suddenly dawned on me that the stuff they were looking for was like R&B stuff from the late 60s, like Wilson Pickett and things like that. So I put together a rhythm section. We went in and we recorded just a bunch of songs based on those grooves and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they loved it. And um, they finished the season and they were very happy and they hired me for another show. Um, and then uh, hired me for one more that never made it to, um, to the light of day. But, um, you know, I was starting to reach the point where um, I was picking up gigs. Um, then, the, uh, once again, went to a friend, a friend of mine had played keyboards in a band I was in, and he was becoming a music editor for feature films. So he invited me to their wed his, his wedding, and there was this woman there who was getting along in, in years. She'd been in Hollywood for quite a while. Uh, she's from Germany, and she and I started talking, the same thing, and, and uh, a couple of three weeks later, I'd given her my number. She called me and she said, would you be interested in talking to a producer about possibly doing a feature film? And I said, yeah, of course. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I did a film which was originally um, called Life on the Edge, got changed to Meet the Hollow Heads. Uh, uh -huh. um, and it was my first feature film and, and uh, um, made a bunch of friends from it and so on and so forth. The film, did, the film didn't do well, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I was, once again, a lot of people in the show liked what I did, wanted to continue using me. And um, Alan Ferguson, who's a very successful composer, uh, used to tell a story about his first film where he, after the film was all over, it had just, he had been a huge success. Everybody loved his music. The, uh, the, and he went out with the director, who was a German guy, and, and Alan said to him, I don't understand why, you know, I did such a good job, I thought my career would just shoot off like a skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And he said, the director said to him, Alan, it's better to be a shit in a hit than a hit in a shit. <laughs> and uh, I, I've always loved that, that, you know, but that that is kind of Hollywood, you know? Yeah, yeah it you, is, it you is. Know, and, uh, Anyway, it's just, um, I feel like I'm going on for a long time here, but uh, so I started doing as much stuff as I could and, and uh, did, you know, ghosting for people mm -hmm. and, um, and I had a good period and, and uh, then the, the pandemic kind of came along mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm leaping forward in time quite a bit here, but... Um, and the thing that came about was two, th um, I need to back up. Uh, the course I studied, Spud Murphy's course, was essentially being taught by a couple of his students and one of them had a lot of students. He was basically the main teacher. And he went to the doctor one day because he wasn't quite feeling well and, and the doctor rushed him from an ambulance to, from his office to the hospital and put him in an induced coma immediately and he passed away very quickly after that. Oh wow. And there was about 20 <laughs> students out there who were halfway through the course and so on and so forth and I'd never had any interest in teaching um, but Lilith, Spud's daughter, called me up and said would you please as a favor you know at least so we can Finish keep this. them going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said sure and I got into it and I went wow I love this. Uh -huh. You know, I love the teaching, the interacting yep. with them. Yep. And more importantly, it, it, from this point in my development as a composer, I was able to see this 1,200 pages of incredibly deep and sophisticated knowledge that Spud had shared with everybody. 
Um, I saw it from a different perspective. I saw it from a perspective of someone who wasn't trying to get there, but someone who had been there and wanted to just be sure. better at it. Sure. And um, so I was teaching that, and, and when the pandemic came along, suddenly I had a huge infusion of students who were saying, I'm not going to be working, so I want to study. And, and so that's, that's been a, uh, something I've really enjoyed over the last uh, eight or nine years. Teaching is actually, I mean, I started teaching recently too, and it's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a neighbor who was studying with a, yoga, uh, with a Tai Chi master uh -huh. who was in his late 70s, early 80s, Japanese, you know, come from Japan. And uh, David was studying with him, and David had just passed 50, I think. And his teacher said to him, David, do you teach? And he says, well, we've got one class, it's kind of, you know, for kids and stuff. And he says, remember... If you turn 50 and you're not teaching, you're a thief. Interesting. You've, you, you've stolen what your teachers have given you and you haven't passed it along. That's really, no, oh, that's very enlightening. Yeah. Very, very kind of zen, mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah. know. And um, so that's kind of how I felt. I felt that it was my duty to, yeah. to pass Spud's knowledge along to future generations. Well, that's one of the reasons I do this show. It's because mm -hmm. I feel that it helps to pass that knowledge on to future generations. Yeah. So let me redirect you Please. a little bit. There's a couple of questions that come to mind. If, if I put myself in the place of a younger person watching mm -hmm. this and sure. listening to you, yes, you have, you know, you, we've gone into a lot of your personal history. Mm -hmm. And there's a common thread there, as I said, which yeah. is, you know, to basically take every gig you can yeah. to a certain extent. And obviously, you know, there are some compromises one doesn't make, and that's personal choice as yep. well as ethos and stuff like that. But you also found yourself really kind of figuring out a lot of what it takes to create music for visuals. Okay. And there's a true art form there. It's, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. I had had a wonderful conversation with a gentleman named Mark Rubel who works mm -hmm. at uh, Blackbird Academy. He's yep. the director of education there. And Mark and I both see music very similarly. And he said something that I thought was very profound. He said, uh, we're, we were talking about, we're both Kurosawa fans. Yeah. And he said, you know, when I'm doing a mix, I try and imagine each part as an actor in yeah. a movie. Yeah. And in doing so, I can figure out what this needs, you know, this guitar play, this guitar part is, you know, in a certain room, in a certain space, you know, what kind of surrounding do, and, and I think that's really profound, and I think it works both ways in terms of you're presented with visual images. Yeah. How do you conceive of the music that, because, you know, the music is going to really have such a dramatic effect and such a subtle and subliminal effect on those visuals. Yeah. So I think in developing that particular sense, talk to me about that a little bit. Okay, yeah, it's, th there's a bunch of components that go into that. One of the things, as I've had potential students, potential composers send me videos that they've done. And the first thing that you can always hear it instantly is a vast majority of them get the tempo wrong. Mm. Okay? It's tempo brings you energy. Yeah. And by, you know, the difference between and this, you know, mm -hmm. is, is significant. Yeah. And, and um, so that's the first thing is to do that. Now, the second thing is one of the things that that most when you when most film composers lecture they talk about yeah it's not the music I want it's the music the director and the producers want mm -hmm. and so consequently you have to give them the emotional impact that they are hoping for Ron Jones says it really well he said we we don't get paid as composers we're not paid to write music 
were paid to enhance the emotional content of the scene that we're performing. Good perspective. Yeah, and um, and and that's very much it. I mean, you know, uh, go back to my roomies example. They'd had three different composers come through there because the composers weren't able to hear what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Once I realized what they were saying is, I love Wilson Pickett. My job was done. Uh -huh. You know, then it was just going home and putting notes on paper. It was like, you know, but, yeah. and, and hiring a good band. That yeah. was, you know. But I think you were realizing a, I mean, yes, you're right. It's, you know, what the director wants, what the producer mm -hmm. wants, but you're also realizing a vision. And mm -hmm. you're realizing a vision um, that to a certain extent, I think, calls for a certain amount of intuition. You know, you're looking at a visual, you know, yeah. and you could go a thousand different directions yeah. musically, yeah. and each one of them is going to be, some of them will be absolutely wrong, but yeah. many of them will be potentially right. Yeah, yeah. I, one of the series I did, I was working with a, a director and a producer, and I think I did eight or ten different documentaries for him about presidents and what happened in their term and so on and so forth and, and and I did one on Reagan and it was very interesting because for the emotional stuff like bumps in his the road of his life before he was president and so on and so forth you had to pay, play the emotion of the scene but because it was a documentary, once you got into the thing where we're talking about Thatcher and, and, and uh, 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 the Russian leaders and people like that, then anytime you're talking about one of the Russian leaders, you're, you're playing a piece of music that sounds Russian because that's what you're doing. You're establishing this nationality. Mm -hmm. When it would be Thatcher, you would play something that sounded like, you know, God British. save the queen. Or, yeah, uh, exactly. And, and um, you know, so basically you were establishing a nationality, you were establishing a mood in that, but you weren't necessarily stating anything emotional, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Tip O'Neill was, one, one of the things, I'd, I'd totally forgotten this, Tip O'Neill and Reagan, every Tuesday night when Congress was in session, had a standing dinner date. You know, of, and well, that's when he was the Speaker of the House and was controlling Congress. Mm -hmm. So he and, he and Reagan could sit down informally and just say, this is what we've got to do as a country to move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, and so consequently, every time Tip O'Neill featured, there would be some, a, a hint of the Irish in the uh, music, uh -huh. you know. And um, so you have to know when, when to play emotions, Happy, sad, you know, f tense. Mm -hmm. uh, the one with one with um, I, I did one on John Kennedy, and of course the the uh, Bay of Pigs was very tense, and and the the uh, missile crisis was more so, mm -hmm. and you know, but then that would be interspersed with pictures of him with his kids at the house in Hyannis, and you know that would be just. So family the mood music. changes. Yeah, and, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And that's what you have to do is you have to enhance that because um, what, one of the guys I ghosted for a lot was Mark Snow. Uh -huh. And I never did any of the scoring on X Files, but I did do a lot of the scoring on Millennium. And then he had another show, a spin off called The Lone Gunman. Mm -hmm. And. Um, what you would have to do is, oh, you would, you would see these scenes and they would be, in the case of the X-Files, Mulder and Scully walking on a harshly lit, bright stage with guns drawn and nothing else going on. And then you'd see the stuff Mark would do and you'd be on the edge of your seat uh -huh. and it was all music. Yeah. So, you know, that was the thing you'd have to watch for. You, it's like, okay, this, this has to be scary. And there's nothing in this picture that's scary. So guess what? It's up mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Mark was the king of that stuff. I mean, he did, what, what seven years of the X-Files? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know. And, well, uh, and I, I mean, 
you raise an interesting point there because, yeah, again, it is very intuitive. It's very much looking at this and looking at it in the context of this whole big picture, yeah. literally. Yeah. You know, what do I want to convey here? Mm -hmm. and, or not what do I want to convey? What does the director want yeah. to convey? What does the filmmaker want to convey? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So bringing that around full circle here, um, you've had a long career in doing this. Yeah. And obviously... Some of that has been intuitive and some of that has been very technical in that sense. Yeah. People coming up now, they have a lot more tools at their disposal. There's a lot more media at their disposal. What would you tell 15-year-old you coming up now? Wow. Um, <coughs> <laughs> it probably doesn't make any difference what I'd tell myself because I wouldn't listen anyway. You know, There's that, yeah. But um, When I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a composer. Okay? When I was... And, and this is one of the things. It's interesting because I, I see... I, I know from that point in time I was destined to be a composer. So you never wanted to be a rock star. Well, I did, but you know, the KCRW in Los Angeles is a NPR mm -hmm. station, and they did a three-hour documentary on George Martin. Uh -huh. Okay, and they were just everything about the Beatles from George Martin's point of view. And I can remember so vividly halfway through that, I was listening in my car, halfway through that thing where I went, you know. I never really wanted to be one of the Beatles. I really always wanted to be George Martin. Uh huh. And and um, big picture. Yeah. And you know, I love writing songs and I love playing guitar. And and uh, you know, being a singing guitar player rescued me all through those first years I came to L.A. Because one Christmas I did forty-two Christmas parties and stuff as you know and I'd be the guitar player to show up with the accordion player and the clarinet and uh -huh. the drummer and and I would sing staying alive you mm -hmm. know that kind of thing yeah. and um, but I, I would just say if you've got a passion absolutely go for it because Spud I'd said Spud was born in 1908 when he became a professional musician in his late teens the music people were playing was the Charleston Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. When he died in his 90s, he was li listening to Stevie Wonder. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Now, think about that. Think of all those. That's quite the, a spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, everybody talks about how long ago Bill Haley and the Comets started that whole rock and roll thing. Spud was in his 50s. He lived to be 90. Mm -hmm. So consequently, so you're going to have to change. You know, the bottom line is wherever you start your journey, you're going to have to change direction. And one would hope that you would evolve. Yes. Isn't that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if evolution doesn't feel natural, then you're probably in the wrong place. Well, and that goes back to something that I've said a lot, which is that uh, when we are young, we think we know exactly where we're going and what we mm -hmm. want to do, and you know, you're you're inevitably going to end up somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Because absolutely. there's going to be tangents, there's going to be things that you didn't think about, and it's good to be that flexible. Which is why I think it's interesting that you, you know, I go, going back to the always say yes theme. Yeah. You know, there's stuff there that you probably never considered. Mm -hmm. Even even saying that you wanted to be a composer. There were, there were obviously gigs that you took that you didn't necessarily yeah. think were in the direction you wanted to go. Yeah. I can, I can remember one night uh, I got called. Somebody had gotten sick in this band that played ethnic Armenian music. All right. Okay. And, and the guy said to me, can you play that? I said, I don't know, but I'll give it a <laughs> shot. He mm -hmm. said, well, we need a body on the stage, so shoot over there. And it was actually pretty easy. It was uh, mostly minor key stuff. Yeah, right? I was going to say a lot of minor <laughs> keys with leading tones. Yep. And and uh, um, and the other guitar player was was a good guy. But I mean, if you'd ever said to me, "Yeah, you're going to be in Hollywood," um, one of the weirdest calls I got ever like that was I was literally going to bed, and and a friend of mine called, and and 
the phone rang and I picked it up and my friend said, are you busy? I said, no, I'm going to bed. It's like 11. And he said, well, we just had our guitar player had a stroke on stage. How fast can you get into Westwood and, and play the gig? And it was right, uh, I was there by 1130, uh -huh. you know, but it was, uh, yeah, never expected that, you know, to, yeah, yeah. so, um, but I just think, I think you need to be persistent. Whatever you do, you need to be persistent and, and um, commit wholeheartedly to what you're doing, but also always be aware that what you're doing may change. Persistent, consistent, and flexible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, well, and yeah. I think that's not just in a music career. No, that's, that's in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. My, my stepbrother was a music, uh, it was a, a film editor at, Tur at Turner Broadcasting and TNT, and he came out here, and he, his whole <laughs> career has been, well, that's not exactly what I expected to be doing, but here I am, <laughs> you know, oh, that's not exactly mm -hmm. what I meant, but, you know, he wants to be a, a, a film or TV director, mm -hmm. and he's not having opportunities, but in the meantime, he's worked on a ton of hit shows, and... What's that old saying? Life is what happens while you're making other plans. That's right. That's yeah. right. True. So, mm -hmm. um, good advice. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the things I'm I'm real interested in, and, and my goal is to have this in place and started by the first of the year, is I want to start a publishing company of my own that is strictly contemporary classical music. Uh huh. And I really have reached the point where I just love writing that. And um, I love the process of hearing it in your head and putting it on paper. And, and uh, that's something also that I don't have to be in Los Angeles to do. Mm -hmm. I can do that from anywhere in the country. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to pursue that. I just wrote a 25-minute long suite called uh, New England Winter uh -huh. that, that's, um, <clears throat> that I'm really excited about. It's for... Um, a concert band, not an orchestra, no string sections, mm -hmm. but all everybody else. All brass. All brass, mm -hmm. woodwinds, and percussion. Uh -huh. Oh, cool. Yeah. And uh, so I, I really want to do that. The, I, I've got to tell you, well, this is flexibility. I don't, I'm not interested in pop music today. Mm -hmm. It does nothing for me emotionally. That's changed. Yeah, it's, definitely it's changed. Different. And, yeah. and I, I had, excuse me, had that experience with my son where he brought me a thing by Akon and, and he said, tell me about this. I want to play, I want you to hear this song. Mm -hmm. I listened to it and it was, it was a beautiful song. The lyrics were as simplistic as they could be. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, Nick, why, why do you love this song? And he said, because I never thought about love that way. And it suddenly dawned on me, yeah, he's 17. I'm not, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and... Yeah. Um, I think that's a, when you listen to some of the Beatles stuff, which at the time I was so blown away by. You listen to their lyrics and you kind of go, "Yeah, that's kind of yeah." yeah it's, it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, we all go through yeah. different stages in development. I mean, you know, look at the later Beatles lyrics. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, so yeah. yeah. Well, I think so. that's but that's really that's something that's very important for people to realize, especially early on in their careers, that it's not going to go the direction you think it's going to go. <clears throat> Nor is anything else in life. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Good advice. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, I, I think, I think you, you summed it up really well when you talked about the flexibility aspect of it. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's... And, and um, I had some friends who I went to high school with who immediately upon graduating from high school went to work in the post office got their 20-year pension and then started on their next job yeah you know and that I just knew that that was not for me and um, you know when I was with Sean and I we played some huge gigs I played one in Pittsburgh where we were the headliners and there was 135,000 people there Wow. and to look on that stage and just look at Let's this see massive, humans, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's something I'll never forget. You know, mm -hmm. it's just an yeah. amazing experience. 
So it wasn't yeah. Woodstock, but it was close enough. You know, it's, it's all about having those experiences. That's right. That's right. So, Glenn Jordan, thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Daniel. I'm glad to do it. And uh, I hope it helps whoever's listening. Oh, I think it will. Good. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.